Good afternoon. Wow. I don't know what else to say of that crop report. Uh, that that was one for the memory books um, coming in. That's a big crop. 175 bushel yield on corn and uh, 48.9 on soybeans. Congratulations to uh, Bevan Everett uh, who coordinated our survey and to those of you who participated in our survey and uh, really frankly nailing this uh, USDA report. Uh, there was the high end of the trade estimates and um, in matched almost exactly within a tenth of a bushel for both corn and soybeans, what USDA said. Now, let's, uh, first of all, I uh, need to post this up here and uh, while we're talking and we're going to go through this crop report, we're going to talk about some of the implications both on the supply side and the demand side. USDA gave us plenty to talk about in this report, and the market's reaction gave us plenty to talk about as well, and I'm sure stimulated some questions with the market going down and then erasing those losses and uh, finishing well, in fact, uh, for such a bearish report. And so we'll talk about that as we go forward. Now, related to that, I want to remind everyone of the obvious that price is still a function of supply and demand, but the not so obvious as modified by the flow of money. And it's that flow of money that changes how price manages supply and demand that creates uh, a lot of the discussion. So we're, that's going to be a big part of what we talk about here today as it is each month. First of all, we're going to start off with what's happening with the dollar. The dollar was lower today and came off of those lows. Bearish news out this morning. Sales and uh, retail sales in the month of July very disappointing. Wholesale price data very disappointing, suggesting deflation is a bigger concern right now than inflation. Uh, between the two of them, and what we've seen of late with uh, productivity data would suggest that uh, to the markets anyway that we're probably not going to see the Fed be able to raise interest rates until well into 2017. So the dollar went lower, uh, but the euro had its own problems today as well. And as the euro slipped, the dollar came off of its lows. This is key because as you see in the right-hand side of that chart, the dollar breaks through that support and breaks lower. That's positive for money flow for the commodities, as we'll show you here in a little bit. On the other hand, if the other currencies break lower, pushing the dollar higher to new highs, then that tends to be negative for money flow. We see that correlation here with the... Uh, weekly CRB index chart, the Thomson Reuters CRB index chart. And we had a nice little uptrend off of the uh, February lows and we broke through that uptrend, but now we're trying to turn higher once again, led by crude oil. Crude oil continues to be one of the lead indicators. It makes a big difference. I'm gonna show you a chart a little bit later on the influence it can have on grain and oil seed prices and uh, what actually ends up being paid at the farm. But keep this in mind, as the strength of the dollar um, goes and the money flow into the major commodity indices tends to go in the opposite direction. And that does have an influence on how we price our grain and oil seeds and even our livestock. Uh, we see the relationship here specifically for corn, soybeans, Chicago wheat, and Kansas City wheat. And we have a strong correlation here. A correlation above 0.7 would be considered to be a healthy correlation, a one-to-one -one correlation would be if A goes up by a certain amount, B goes up by the same amount. And anything greater than 0.7 would be considered a pretty good correlation. And you can see here, looking back since January of 2008, we've had a pretty good correlation, not only of uh, inverse correlation between the dollar and the CRB, but a, a positive correlation between the CRB and the amount of money in the corn, soybean, and wheat markets. Now, as we look at how the commodities have performed overall, we can see this is year to date. It's been a wild year. We've seen some division in the commodities, some commodities performing very well this year and others not. And one of the things that I would argue is that basically we're becoming a protein market focused more on protein. We have ample supplies of carbohydrates I think this today's USDA crop report continues to confirm that while protein supplies in the world are starting to tighten up. Protein in demand as we have a greater segment of our world population seeing increasing income, moving from a starch-based diet 
to a protein-based diet. That means more meat, and it takes protein to produce that meat. And so we're having trouble keeping up with that production on a global basis of the crops that supply protein. That's not just soy meal, that also includes DDGs or dried distillers, grains, and solubles. <clears throat> now, let's start looking at the numbers from today, and we're going to start off here uh, with the wheat numbers, and then we'll finish up with corn and soybeans. Let's uh, first talk about wheat. We won't spend a lot of time talking on wheat, uh, but I, I didn't want to forget it, so I thought we'd start with it right off the bat. 2.321 billion bushels of wheat. That's a pretty good sized wheat crop, much bigger than what was anticipated. When we make the breakdown there in the red numbers across the top is what USDA indicated today. Uh, overall, the winter wheat coming in larger than anticipated, including uh, the hard red winter wheat and also white wheat. Hard red winter wheat at 1.048 billion bushels, pretty close to our estimate here at INTLFC Stone. Soft red winter wheat crop was pretty close as well, but the trade was also pretty close there. Hard red winter came in 15 million larger than what the trade was anticipating. White wheat overall coming in about 13 million more than what the trade anticipated. Hard red spring coming in smaller, quite a bit smaller than what the trade anticipated. And that's one reason why we had the strong finish. It was just slightly smaller than what our estimate was. Pretty strong finish for Minneapolis wheat today. Durham coming in at 92 million, better than was expected by either us or the trade. As we look at the numbers specifically and the change this month from last month, we saw the increase in yields basically in the eastern Midwest Great Lakes area as well as in the Central Plains area uh, and including in Missouri and in the Pacific Northwest, seeing those yield increases go up as well with the exception of Montana, the rest of that region in the Northwest seeing an increase in yields from last month. Now, Let's get down to the meat of this report. I mentioned already the yield that most people know, the yield of 175.1 bushels would be a record corn yield. 48.9 bushels on soybeans would be record as well. Um, that here again coming in almost exactly what our INTL FC stone estimates were, and those of course were the largest in the industry. I would say that um, if you look at the strong export sales numbers that we had on Thursday morning and the market's uh, lethargic reaction to that export sales data, it was my premise at that point that there was a whispered number that was higher than the average trade estimates. And I think today's reaction to these numbers suggests that the whispered number may have been up there near those FC Stone numbers. In other words, the trade put down what its estimates were, we got the average estimate, but then started to fear that USDA would come out with even larger numbers. And in fact, that's what USDA did, but the market had already priced in expectations of larger numbers. Now, as we watch through much of the post-market reaction, I felt like maybe that whisper number was still lower than what USDA came out with, but we did have that strong pricing late in the day. Uh, bringing us near unchanged on day, even positive in, for corn prices. And uh, when bearish news fails to hold us, uh, when you fail to get a sell-off on bearish news, got to take note, got to respect that. To our producers out there who are watching, don't get lulled into a false sense of complacency here. The board can put in a bottom because you have money flow into the board, but the cash market will still do its job the cash market will still go to a low enough place to try to find enough demand to get rid of those bushels and to find storage for all the excess bushels that don't get consumed. The cash market do its job. Look at the wheat market, for an example, where the board stopped and the cash kept going down and we have basis in some parts of the plains well over a dollar below what the board's at. The cash market will do its job. The board may not go down to reflect these fundamentals, but the cash will do its job until in, in balancing supply and demand, trying to discourage production and stimulate product and stimulating demand. Now, total crop 15.153 billion for corn, 4.06 billion for soybeans. Those are pretty big crops. Now, as we look at the corn yield, this is versus the previous year. You can see here that 
yields were up um, for most of the Midwest versus year ago levels, the exception being in Minnesota where they had an exceptional crop last year as well as in South Dakota. Otherwise, most Midwest states really seeing that increase in year ago levels. Uh, I think if there's any debate, it's going to be in the eastern Midwest. We probably took yield off over the last week to 10 days in the eastern Midwest since USDA was out there, but we probably added the same amount of yield in central and western areas. So I don't think that we can really make that argument as far as uh, what's happened since then. The mantra is going to be big crops get bigger. Now, this is a breakdown of some of the data. And you can see here the ear population uh, that USDA found, it's actually at a four-year low, a four-year low in ear population, but record high ear weight is how we got the yield. Now, notice the little note down at the bottom that I've circled, implied ear weight. So USDA did its calculations and divided it by population to come up with what the yield was. If those ear weights come in smaller, we see the yield drop. If the ear weights come in higher, we see the yield go up. What's the odds? Well, USDA is making an assumption we have normal weather from here on out. And if you look at today's weather forecast, more so today than yesterday, but if you look at today's weather forecast, it's hard to argue with that. We're expected to see good moisture over the next couple of weeks. Temperatures may be on the warm side, maybe some more warm nights that may interfere somewhat with that, but still not enough to really be able to make a solid argument. So at this point, I think you have to assume normal filling conditions at this point, but we're going to have to come back and revisit that ear weight question in September and see just what we turned out to get as USDA pulls those ears and actually weighs them. Soybean yield, here again, very similar to corn, with the exception of Minnesota and South Dakota and Michigan raising those yields from year ago levels. Kentucky also going down, uh, Arkansas going down on yields from year ago levels, uh, but uh, the core of the Midwest increasing yields from year ago levels. Well, what does this mean in the way of ending stocks? First of all, for wheat, 1.1 billion bushels. Not far off from the US, uh, from the trade gas or from our estimate, 13, 14 million bushels, pretty small uh, margin of error there as a percentage goes. Uh, I am concerned yet about whether we're going to be able to feed that wheat. USDA raised their wheat feeding estimate while also giving a big boost to their corn feeding estimate. And I think it's really, you could really make a case where their feeding estimate was too high for corn anyway. So from one month to the other, we saw a significant increase. Um, the, the number slips from mine are sitting here right now, don't have right in front of me, like 175 million bushel combined between wheat and corn, increased feeding from a month ago. Our livestock numbers haven't changed from a month ago. And, the, and so you'd say, okay, lower prices is going to encourage expansion, particularly in pork and in poultry. And that does tend to be the case. But when you look at the livestock numbers in this USDA crop report, USDA did not show that big of an increase. So once again, I think this is an area where demand numbers are suspect. And that plays into the corn number, as I talked about corn feeding. Uh, between the corn feeding and corn exports, I think you could safely say that their numbers are on the high end of the possible ranges of what might happen. Cheap prices do encourage more demand. Cheap prices may be essential to get this level of demand. And so it's a, a double-edged sword going forward here. 2.4 billion bushels of corn is a lot of corn left over. We could very easily end up with 2.6 billion but even if those ear weights drop by September and we see the final production number come back down, we end up with a 2 billion bushel carryout, it's still a lot of corn. Doesn't make a lot of difference on the price scenario going forward. Soybeans at 330 million bushels, USDA again raising their demand estimate, surprising 95 million bushel increase for this late in the game for old crop soybean demand between crush and exports. 
I think that may have been a little bit optimistic there, but you can make the argument a lot easier for soybeans than what you can for corn, but still probably a little bit on the optimistic side. And when it comes to new crop, I think you can, uh, you can justify the demand increases that they made, but it's going to have our crush capacity operating near capacity when you include downtime, typical downtime that we have in our plants. So things are going to have to go well and to go right. And this does put the pressure now on South America to produce. The odds of a weather problem in South America have gone down, now looking like a weak La Nina overall, but it, they haven't been ruled out. And the margin for error for a problem in South America has become much smaller. And I would argue that, uh, well, I'll maybe save that argument until we talk about world stocks, which here we are. Here's USDA's ending stock for soybeans of 71.24 million metric tons. Uh, the trade is at 67.6 million metric tons. My estimate is 64.5 million. Primary difference there is I think USDA is pretty optimistic about Argentine and Brazilian production for the coming year. Argentina is rotating toward corn. Brazil is with having significant um, problems with its economy and with credit, I think it's gonna have a real problem getting the expansion that I first thought they would get and that USDA seems to be assuming that they would get. I've been pulling my new 2016-17 soybean production estimates lower. USDA has not yet. I think they're overly optimistic in what they may be and underestimating probably demand in the China. More about that in a little bit. On the corn side, 220.8 million metric ton ending stocks, pretty high number, pretty good number there. I'm at 228.71. What's the big difference there? I think uh, USDA's overestimating demand is the primary place. Wheat, 252.8 versus a trade at 251.6. Very close there. I'm at 244.25. The primary difference is I expect USDA to make substantial cuts yet beyond what they made today in the size of the European crop. Now, looking at final soybean stocks, since that's the uh, one that really matters and that's where the real trends are, you can see here, looking back at the last 20 years, USDA does have a tendency to overestimate soybean ending stocks for the new crop year in its August crop report. And so the bias is here that while this number is adequate, it's probably going to get smaller. Demand is the biggest area where USDA tends to falter, or maybe I should say another way. USDA is very good at one thing, underestimating global soybean demand. And if that proves to be the case again this year, we could very easily see those stocks pull lower on the new crop, currently at 330 million bushels. They have overestimated that the size of the crop in 13 out of the last 20 years by a little better than 100 million bushels, if my memory serving me correctly from when I left my desk, um, which would pull us down into very tight territory as a percent of annual usage. Now, where do yields go from here? You can study this yourself as far as each, uh, each of the individual years that yields went up between August and the final January numbers versus down. But the bottom line is those years when you have big crops, the big crops tend to get bigger. When you have smaller yields in the August estimate, the crops tend to get smaller. Our next survey, which Bevan is coordinating, will be, we'll be releasing the results on September 2nd. So after hitting it this time, pressure's on Bevan. We'll see how we do the next time and where it come out. But thanks go to you, the clients, for doing an excellent job of filling out those, uh, those surveys for us. Now, what are the possibilities here? Well, you see my numbers here on the left with the 175.1 yield. That gives 2.7 billion bushel carryout. That's much bigger than what USDA is, and that's because I believe USDA is too high on its demand estimates. <clears throat> My bearish scenario, well, what if we do get bigger, big crop get bigger? What if it is a 178 yield? I did make a few adjustments on demand because a bigger crop 
lower prices and you do tend to find more demand with lower prices but still ended up with almost a 3.3 billion bushel carryout. On the other hand, what if we don't finish well and we end up with a 168 yield that USDA forecast back in May? Ending stock, well here again with higher prices that does tend to chew into demand a little bit but nonetheless I still come up with the 1.8 billion bushel carryout. Hardly consider that bullish does give us a marketing year average cash price of 365, but it is less bearish and does help you put a long-term bottom in the markets perhaps. Even with today's market reaction, if we continue to see crude oil going higher, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw this bottom hold in the market. Is it what I expect? No, I do expect us to make new lows in this market is corn and wheat battle for that feed sector. But would I be surprised if the money flow is possible if we put in a bottom? Not at all. I'm watching crude oil and I'm watching the dollar. Those are gonna be my two big indicators. Looking at soybeans, I come up with 323 million met, uh, bushels ending stocks based on the numbers and that we're given, the fresh data we're giving here today. I have a little bit of adjustments in my demand estimates, but overall pretty close to USDA considering our yields uh, are in agreement right now with USDA. Now what if the crop gets bigger? A 50 bushel yield, very possible. Here again, bigger yields, lower prices, strengthens demand. Ending stock still at 471 million bushels, marketing year average price, $8.90. Uh, on the other hand, what if we don't finish or we have widespread sudden death syndrome that that begins to develop across the Midwest or other disease problems? We end up with a 45.5 bushel yield. Well, based on what we're seeing in current demand trends, that would suggest ending stocks of 141 million bushels, marketing year average cash price of 1220. Those are the broader and the same thing with the corn. I provide what I anticipate happening, the most likely to happen, then provide the parameters around the outside, maybe the borders or the fences, maybe so to speak, on the more probable upside or downside type of scenarios. And so there is a bullish potential scenario with the soybeans. We don't have much margin for error here in South America. Is there fodder here for a bullish market? No, but here again, I'd probably be less surprised by soybeans putting in a bottom right here, particularly until we know more about how the South American crop is going to end up. Talking about that South American crop, as I said, La Nina now looks to be a weak La Nina through the end of the year. The correlation with dry weather in Argentina and Southern Brazil is directly related to the strength of that La Nina. So that would suggest a lower probability of dry weather during the early part of their growing season. However, there are other factors and without the strength of the ENSO cycle, which is the La Nina, El Nino cycle, without the strength of that cycle driving it, you can have these other things pop up and create problems or create favorable growing conditions. One of the things we're watching is sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. Right now, they tend to favor more dryness. Here again, this is not a strong signal, but one we have to watch. So I would sum it up by saying the odds of adverse weather have gone down, but we have not eliminated the risk. And with the balance sheet relatively tight and getting tighter, protein being the primary driver, it still justifies this market keeping some interest, so to speak, in the oil seed complex, in the protein complex, and watching for opportunities, depending on whether you're a producer or an end user, those opportunities are gonna be on opposite sides of the spectrum but it does suggest quite a bit of volatility may very well be ahead for the soybean market. When we look at the demand side, specifically here looking at China, you can see the curve almost becoming exponential. And when you look at this, once again, the only years that we tend to not reach that curve are years when we have economic problems in China. China produces 54% of the world's hogs between pork and poultry expansion. And, and, de and expansion in per capita consumption, demand is gonna be strong. The primary question at this point is with the new pollution regulations they have in China, 
Will China be able to expand its pork production sufficiently to meet the demand? If not, then that production is going to take place in other countries of the world be imported into China. And the soy meal, the DDGs, the other proteins are produced, be, uh, be consumed at various places around the world, including here in the United States, uh, including Canada and, and other places. If China is able to expand production sufficiently, then much of the consumption will take place there. Let's take a look at the weather here quickly. The top across the top is the temperature on the left, precipitation on the right for the next five days. We have a system currently moving across the Midwest, providing good rains for much of the Midwest. Temperatures, warm temperatures kind of exiting to the north and the east. Very similar temperature pattern for as far as above normal temperatures. Uh, as we go into the 6 to 10 day, rains again focusing on central and western parts of the Midwest and then shifting to the east again, uh, as well as in the west on the 11 to 15 day. No real heat problems through the next 15 days. Good rainfall distribution overall. Uh, looks like it's going to finish well. We're going to pick up some good rains in some of those remaining pockets that, that are dry, particularly Indiana and Ohio. Now, looking at the 16 to 30 day across the top, pretty good temperatures once again for finishing off the crop. Good moisture for all but the Great Lakes area overall, but keep in mind they're getting good moisture though in the next 15 days to help finish off the crops. We still may end up short in a few of those areas in the Northeast. And if you look at September, we see kind of that trend kind of hold in September as well. Generally normal to above normal temperatures. And in October, looks very good for dry down of crops and bringing the crops in in quick order. That creates some storage problems. So that may be a challenge if all the crop comes to town at one time. Here I show the crop condition index scores for corn on the top, soybeans on the bottom. So you can see the green bar showing the condition index score for the current year, that far right board, um, a bar relative to the last 30 years during the same week of the year, the blue line at the top being the final yield that year. Uh, the one exception I see here is I did not get the yields updated on these graphs before I posted it. My apologies for that. The corn yield should be bumped up to 175 and soybeans up to 48.9. But you can see there how we compare with other years, and of course soybeans only had one other year that had a higher crop rating at this time of the year, and that was 1994. That was a big one, as you may recall. So what are the take-home points? First of all, remember that USDA assumes normal weather from this point forward. Not a lot of reason to argue with that at this point. USDA's demand estimates are on the high end of expectations, particularly for corn and I would argue for wheat as well, especially on the feed side. This is a real concern because yes, maybe the crops don't finish as well as USDA anticipates, but demand may not as well. So it's really hard to build a bullish case in here from a fundamental standpoint. Uh, USDA's 2016-17 South American soybean estimates I think are inflated. We're seeing a big acreage shift from soybeans to corn and wheat in Argentina. And in, in Brazil, we simply don't have the financing available for producers to make the expansion that USDA is looking forward to. There will be little margin for error in soybeans as we go through uh, the next six months. The fall weather favors a quick dry down and quick harvest. Storage space will be at a premium from all appearances at this point with substantial basis risk. We can see a number of places pushing the basis lower, trying to discourage delivery of grain till they can find a place to put it. But then once it finds a home, once that grain finds a home, we could see that basis recover. Still takes a lot of grain moving through the pipeline on a weekly basis in order to supply this strong demand that we have this year. Uh, and the farmer isn't likely to want to sell at these low prices. So once the grain does find a home, it may get locked into bin until next spring or next summer. In the meantime, here again, that type of scenario would say weak basis early and then basis slowly starting to come back once again. Uh, as we look at the bottoms are posted, and I think today that's very apropos, shall we say, with the way we finished. 
bottoms tend to be posted when everything looks the bleakest, just like highs in the market are posted when everything looks most bullish. But again, my warning to the producers out there, just because the board puts a bottom in doesn't mean that the cash will do so. Protect your risk. The number one objective right now is to protect the equity that you built in the farm over the last 10 years. And watch that money flow. What does the dollar do? What does, what does crude oil do? If that money flow switch positive, then we can see prices end up higher than what we otherwise would expect based on the fundamentals. If the money flows negative, it drives prices lower. And I see here, I come to the end and I left out the slide that I wanted to show to illustrate that point. If you take a chart and I have charts and I'll try to put it in for next month, my apologies for not putting it in this time. And if you put price against stocks as a percent of use, you get a nice regression curve, we call it in the analysis, showing where the price should end up based on what the stocks to use ratio is. But in reality, those points end up being either side of that line. And as you look at what are the reasons for being either side? Well, one reason is if you're in a, you've been having really high prices and you start getting bearish fundamentals, you have farmers pre-pricing or pricing ahead of those high prices before they fall. And the opposite is true as well. But the other big factor we found in our analysis is simply money flow. If money flow toward the commodities is positive, you can take the same fundamentals and the market may value those same fundamentals for corn maybe 50 cents higher than they would if money flow is negative on either side of that line. In other words, you can be 50 cents above the line if money flow is positive, 50 cents below if it's negative. And in other words, the same fundamentals might justify $4 corn if the if the line says that stocks to use should justify 350 corn or three dollar corn if the money flows negative and on soybeans it's closer to 75 cents to a dollar either side of that line here again i'll try to put that chart in next month so you can see it but money flow does matter and that's looking at cash prices not just board price that's cash prices so anyway that concludes our comments for today so I'm going to open it up for questions. And uh, so if you have any questions, be sure to send them in right now. We'll give you a few minutes in order to uh, put your questions in and uh, we'll try to answer them. We had tremendous response. I know there's a lot of you out there participating today. We really appreciate that. Appreciate the response we've had and uh, from uh, participation in the webinar. But give us your questions now, and we'll try to answer them while we're online here and give you a few minutes to, uh, to input your questions into uh, the market or into the webinar here. Uh, once again, nice finish to the markets today um, with a, a positive finish on a very bearish report. Big crops do tend to get bigger, and that's going to be my bias going forward is uh, based on history that will get bigger from here. But there is still that opportunity to go either way, depending on how we finish out, depending on USDA's uh, methodology. It's very difficult to envision a bullish scenario at this point. Certainly could see uh, a less bearish scenario. And when you look at the soybeans, we could go a little, we could go more bearish or we could go more, more bullish. Right now we're really uh, riding that line very tightly. Uh, with very little margin for error in South America. If our crop gets bigger, that margin for error gets smaller. If our crop gets smaller, then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a rationing position. So without that, looks like apparently you explained it well. I don't see any questions being submitted here. So uh, at this point, uh, then uh, uh, we will close it off and say be back with us next month. And we, oh, we do have a question come in here. Let me uh, here we've got a number of questions come in. Okay, can you speak to the potential corn basis difference in the western corn belt versus the eastern? A much bigger supply of corn, old crop and anticipation of new crop coming in in the west than the east. So that suggests that we could see a lot more pressure on the basis. And last year we saw actually a movement of corn from the west to the east. It's still premature to say if we're going to um, be at a production deficit in the East. I don't know that we can make that assumption 
to see that movement this year like we saw last year, but we do expect to see that basis relationship once again. Uh, here's a, and that question was from Marvin. Here's a question from Andrew. Today's report was seen as mostly bearish. Can you explain why we didn't see a larger sell-off in the market? And uh, excuse me, I would say to a great extent, I think it's because the market was fearing such a bearish reaction, and we were seeing very positive money flow with the strength in the crude oil and in the weaker dollar. Those factors working together. Ron. Where do you expect carries going forward in uh, soybeans, corn, hard red winter wheat, and uh, in, in the, in the uh, dark northern spring? Uh, I'm looking for carries to increase uh, with the supply that we have out there. Soybeans, not so much. I think soybeans are going to continue to see the front end demand will probably flatten, have maybe a little invert, less inverse than what we've been. Um, but corn and wheat, uh, I think we could see those inverses uh, grow. Steve asks, any thoughts about the capacity of the U.S. river and rail system to handle big crop? Uh, excellent question. It's something I didn't get a chance to look into today with these capacities. Um, certainly, we're in a little bit better situation in a rail situation than, than what we were uh, maybe in 2014 when we were seeing uh, the Balkans uh, the northern oil production being so strong. So maybe not the problem to the extent that we saw back then, but I do think that uh, transportation is going to be a, a concern this year, particularly with the strong export program and strong processor program both. So this uh, this will be uh, a real challenge. Uh, Francisco, can you give insights on the recent Chinese sales or inventories for grains? There are rumors that quality is not good, so it raises question how much inventories we really have on a global basis. And of course, China does hold a big share of the inventories that we have, especially for corn. It's over half of the world's surplus corn stocks. And I think quality is a real concern. That's one reason we continue to see strong end user, Chinese end user buying of U.S. grain sorghum. And of course, USDA increased both its old crop and new crop grain sorghum um, export targets today, and a good thing because it really boosted its production estimates well. Grain serving crops are looking really well. We haven't seen that same push in U.S. corn. We have seen a little U.S. corn going to China, and if the quality continues to be a problem, I think we will see that blending. Soybeans, seen some similar quality issues, but China doesn't have the huge surpluses of soybean stocks that it does corn. Uh, I think the corn's a real concern. We've heard some talk about maybe China will enter the export program trying to export some of surplus corn. Uh, I think there's some real questions about quality and positioning of where that corn is relative to the export terminals. I am not expecting it, particularly since I think China's actions in buying Syngenta and, and just looking at its own balance sheet and trends expects to start running tight on corn if it doesn't get its yields up here in a few years. And I don't think they want to ship away surplus and uh, then have to come back and import once again. Dan, <clears throat> Arlen, what do you think price is potentially falling to loan rate at harvest for feed grains? Will impact farmers' marketing actions and, and reactions? Will people check out and hold grain until they see better marketing opportunities? That's certainly what we saw in wheat. Most did not think a month before harvest that we'd see wheat at marketing loan levels, and we certainly did, especially in the high plains. And when it goes in the loan, it's unavailable to the market. And that starts uh, starts firming, putting in a bottom in prices then at that point. You think, surely we won't go to marketing loan on corn. Well, I don't expect it, but with these numbers, I certainly cannot rule it out whatsoever. It's something that uh, we have to be wary of and respect that possibility. Gabriel, what would be the best ver vertices to play? A reversal on soybeans 2017 curve through the calendar spreads, buying January against July. Uh, Gabriel, I'm going to have to take a look at that. Uh, feel free to contact me through your uh, through your broker and uh, we'll take a look at that and, and see where we in, may end up on that. Scott, in the U.S., what percentage of the new crop corn coming on has farmers forward contracted? That's a good question. We don't have any good way in this country as we do in some other countries 
to determine that. But overall, the sense is that this corn crop is not heavily forward contracted. And so an educated guess based on what I've seen would be that we were merely in the 15 to 20 percent range. Uh, and that's I and if anything, we may be a little bit high on that. Not a lot of this crop has been forward contracted because we have so much old crop left over and farmers tend to not want to be aggressive in pricing new crop until they've priced old crop. Francisco, cotton prices went up a lot recently. How can this impact crop rotation next year? Does it compete with soybeans and our corn for area and resources? I, I do think it'll compete. Uh, cotton, of course, has high expenses. Many of those expenses are related to prote yield production potential as well. We have seen a sharp increase, and I'm going to say I think that market overdid it after the July report to the upside. We've seen a sharp correction lower. I do think that globally now with what's happening in China in releasing reserves and getting that from over our head, that we have turned a corner like crude oil did in February. We see the light at the end of the tunnel where demand is starting to catch up with supply and we're starting to chew down those stocks. But the stocks are still very, very large. I was doing some rough calculations earlier today after the report came out. Global cotton stocks are still expected to be uh, at, uh, what, about a 300-day supply, massive supply. So I think the market's overreacted. It's corrected lower. I'm not sure that correction is done yet, but I do think we're going to see enough speculative interest in there to keep the money flow involved and probably keep some attractive options in there for producers to help buy that back. And I do think it'll compete well uh, with corn and soybeans next spring in the South, but that's six, eight months from now, and we'll see how those dynamics change. John, are the old crop export targets reachable? Roughly how much corn and soybean exports don't show up in the weekly inspections or shipments? You're right in the fact that inspections, which are reported each Monday, does not include all exports. There are some that shipments that are made that are not inspected, namely donations, but also some related to NAFTA going either north or south, and that there is a, a couple percent or so that in a varies from year to year that frequently uh, do not show up. And in fact, if you, you look at the Census Bureau data even now, uh, soybean shipments and Census Bureau data tends to be a couple months delayed. Um, shipments are much bigger than what USDA shipment totals, inspection totals, I should say, would indicate. And this is what USDA is starting to go off of in raising their target. I do think it can reach its soybean target because of the acceleration in shipments and the shutting off of supplies from South America in recent weeks. I think USDA may be 5 to 10 million too high on soybeans, but otherwise I think it can do it. On corn, um, it's going to be a close call. Uh, I think it can do it, but I think they're probably overstating the old crop um, by May, May anywhere from 25 to 50 million bushels. We'll be watching that closely. Uh, Gabriel asking, how long do you think the premium on um, BZ, beans, corn, could persist? Uh, Oh, and uh, is that supposed to be CZ, December corn? Could be, uh, now I'm apparently reading it wrong. What would trigger so this premium could ease, uh, could ease somehow? I think we have some um, problems with the translation there. And uh, sorry for that. Uh, ask it again in a different way, and we'll try to get back with you on that, Gabriel. Uh, Marvin asks, how low egg and hog markets temper demand? for grains even with the low prices. Looking at uh, these low feed prices, they're going to keep the margins in there for hogs. I think the bigger concern as we go in the end of the year is what's slaughter capacity going to be for hogs. And I think it's one of the things pressing uh, the problems on hogs. If we don't hit that slaughter capacity, then we very well may keep hog prices high enough um, to keep consumption high. But if we do hit that, we could certainly put much more downside pressure on the hogs, make it much more difficult to hit those consumption uh, requirements. 
Daniel, with piles of wheat on the ground in Kansas, poor prices are present. There are concerns about what fall 2016 winter wheat seedings will be. Do you have a sense of what wheat producers in other countries will do in terms of their 2017 wheat crop plans? Well, the big key here is the currency exchange rates. For many of the crops, while we're looking at multi-year lows, other countries who we compete with are looking at all-time highs or close to all-time highs in uh, when conversions for currencies are made. So they still have um, incentive to expand. And of course, wheat can be grown in just about anywhere. So I think it's a real concern. And I think we continue to shift away from wheat production here in the United States uh, as a result of that until or unless we can bring the dollar significantly lower and our competing currencies higher relative to the dollar. That point, that's all the questions that we have. Unless we have another one quickly come in, uh, we'll be wrapping it up shortly. Looks like all the questions, if you uh, have another one, uh, you can get it to us through your contact here at INTLFC Stone. We're glad you were with us once again this month. We thank you for your participation. This has been a big hit, largely because of you, the, uh, the viewers, and your participation level. It's been, uh, been great having you on board. And uh, look for us again next month when we see what USDA does with their estimates. Will big crops get bigger or will we fail to finish these crops and start pulling this, uh, these production numbers back down? Will these be the highest numbers? One last question, uh, Gustavo, how long the Brazilian corn premium? Brazilian corn, okay, could persist further compared to US prices. Is there any short-term trigger so this could ease from here? Uh, this is part of the dynamics going forward, pushing the strength of uh, U.S. corn exports. And so as we look at this, I think we're going to see Brazilian prices remain strong for quite some time. From what I'm seeing, the exports that we see in Brazil are largely probably spoken for already. I don't think that we'll see a lot of export contracts being written above what's already been written for the Safrina crop. And so uh, that, I think, will keep the supply tight, particularly with the expectation now that Brazil may need to import up to 60 million bushels of uh, corn, much of it coming from Argentina, some of it coming from the United States, if they're able to uh, um, get a waiver on the rest of the GMO hybrids that have not not been approved in Brazil relative to the United States. But I think that helps keep a healthy premium in order to assure that that corn does flow inward and not excessively outward. And so I think Brazil maintains that premium. Glad you were able to get that question in. We'll be with you again next month. Come back then. We'll look forward to it.